Hello and welcome back to Nunley Math. I am your host, Aaron Nunley. I want to thank you so much for joining us here today as we look at radicals and rational exponents. Um, we're going to talk about how square root and radical symbols are related to our discussion of exponents. Now, I do know that um, if you travel down the rabbit hole of, of radicals, you could really end up spending multiple lessons talking about those. And in fact, we are going to spend a lot of time looking at radical symbols um, a little farther down the road at, uh, in, in our video series. But but for now, we just really want to get a basic idea of how radicals work, review that real quick, and look at their connection to what we are learning with exponents and exponent rules. Um, so we're going to try to, not to travel too far down the rabbit hole of, uh, of radicals, but we do uh, definitely want to make some connections. If these are really of interest to you, uh, make sure you can come back when we're talking about the uh, square root and radical unit, um, and I'm sure you'll find that to be very, very interesting. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I do have an example here to kind of illustrate this, um, what we're going to learn today. So if you would, let's take a look at this one. Suppose you have a square with an area of 64 centimeters squared. Can you determine the side lengths of the square? And I would recommend you pause the video and try that on your own real quick. Um, I'm going to assume you've already done that and I'm going to keep going. Because this is a square and we're talking about area, it's important for us to know the area of a square formula. Uh, area equals length times width. I am not going to go into why that is or where that comes from. That certainly is important, but it should be something you're already well aware of um, at this point in your studies. If not, um, you'll want to go back and, and look up a video on that one. But what's interesting about a square is every rectangle has an area of length times width, but squares are unique in the fact that they have all sides congruent as well as all right angles. For us today, we're going to talk about this idea of all sides congruent because if the length and width are the same, we can use the same variable to express them when they are unknown. Instead of you having to use L for one and W for the other, I can call them both X because they both have the same measure. And I can abbreviate that using our exponents. I can say, well, X times X is just X squared and I can fill in my area which is 64. Now at this point, this problem is saying to us what multiplied by itself equals 64? Hopefully you already know that and most of you have come up with an 8. 8 times 8 is 64. Um, but there is another solution to this. Do you know the other one? Negative 8 also works because negative 8 times negative 8 is also a 64. Now, because we're dealing with geometry and side lengths, in general we're going to be ignoring the negative solution, but I felt, felt it was important for you to at least realize there are two solutions to this problem. Now, more to our point today. Since 8 squared is 64, 8 is referred to as being a root or a square root of 64. Now I do want to make the point that the idea of this as not just 8 to the second power but 8 squared does go back to the geometric representation of a square and how to find the area of a square you take something times itself. Um, just a little historical note, that, that is where we derive that name from. Um, but 8 is considered to be the root because 8 is the side length or the length of the side that is used when you have an area of 64. Now, squaring a number like 8 squared and finding the root of a square are inverse operations. It's the opposite of each other. If I knew the side lengths, I would square those to get the area. If I know the area, I work in reverse by finding the root in order to find the side lengths. In fact, we could say it this way. This is an example of the problem written as squaring x squared equals 64 or x times itself equals 64. But it means the exact same thing as this x is, or the side lengths are, the positive and negative roots of 64. Notice I put the positive and negative symbol in here because we said before there were two solutions, but in the case of a square we're going to ignore the negative solution because we don't typically have negative side lengths. The important thing being these two are equivalent equations, meaning they mean the exact same thing. They both require a solution of 8 and negative 8. 
take a look here. Here's another example. This is a square root symbol. It says find the roots of 81. And because I'm using this particular symbol, this symbol means just give the positive answer. In most cases, we know there's also going to be a negative answer, but this symbol says give us the positive one. So this is saying what times itself equals 81, and hopefully you realize that is a 9. How about that one? Did you get 6? How about that one? 11. And that one? 5. Each of these also has a negative root, but because of the symbol we've chosen to use, we are going to ignore the negative root for now. Let me give you a related example. Suppose you have a cube with a volume of 343 cubic centimeters. Can you determine the side lengths of the cube? Take just a second, pause the video, try that on your own. I'm going to assume you've already done that. Hopefully you are aware of the volume of a rectangular prism formula, which says that the length times the width times the height is the volume. Fortunately, because we were told this is a cube, we know that the length, the width, and the height are all the same. So I can represent those with the same variable, and then I can abbreviate that using my, uh, my, my exponent notation, x to the third power. Now we're given the volume, which leads us to this equation. What times itself times itself again is equal to 343? Any idea what that is? It's actually a 7. 7 times 7 is 49. 49 times 7 is 343. So 7 to the third power is 343. Notice in this instance a negative 7 would not work because negative 7 times negative 7 times negative 7 is three negative signs and would give you a negative 343. Anytime this is odd, you're going to end up with, um, typically end up with one solution that works. If it's even, you'll typically end up with two solutions, an, an odd and a, or say a positive and a negative solution to this problem. Now, since 7 to the third power equals 343, we say that 7 is the cube root of 343. Notice, when I know the side lengths, I cube them to find the volume of the cube. Notice the connection back to geometry. If I'm doing the reverse of that, if I know the volume and I want to know how long the sides are, I find the cube root. In other words, they're inverse operations. And these two equations mean the same thing. Something to the third power is 343. So that number is the cubic root of 343. And in both cases, they're the same. They both give you a 7. How about this? Do you know the cube root of 8? What times itself times itself again is 8? Well, that's a 2. Do you know the cube root of 125? 5 times 5 times 5. How about the cube root of 27? 3 times 3 times 3? How about the cube root of 216? Well, that's just 6 times 6 times 6. See how that works? I don't think it's too bad. Now, in fancy math speak, we would say, in general, if b to the n equals a, I'm going to circle that, if b to the n equals a, then b is the nth root of a. This is the same as saying the nth root of a is b. Both of these equations represent the exact same relationship. It's just organized a little bit differently. Notice, of course, that symbol is called a radical, and the n is called the index. So that if I said to you, find the indicated root or roots of a, and I said it has an index of 3, and a is a negative 27, this question is asking you, what cubed equals negative 27, or the cubic root of negative 27 is what? Either way, it's a negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9 times negative 3 is negative 27. How about example 2? The index is 4, the number is 16. That means what to the fourth power is a 16 or the fourth root of 16 is what? Notice I put the positive and negative signs in here. That's because this is going to have two answers. Um, 
you have a 2 to the 4th power 16, but also 4 negative 2's is 16. When this index is even, you got to be careful about that to make sure you get them both. When the index was odd, we only had the 1. Take just a second, pause the video and try these three on your own. I'm going to assume you've already done that. I'm going to help you set these up. The cube root of negative 1,000 is negative 10 because negative 10 times negative 10 is 100 times negative 10 is negative 1000. The sixth root of 64, what times itself um, six times is going to make a 64? Or six of what number multiplied together is a 64? Well, two works, but negative two also works. Notice I put the plus minus sign there to make sure we got them both. The fourth root of 625 is 5 or negative 5. Let me write the symbol in there so I don't miss it. Because this is even, I've got to be careful about that. I did put a little graphic here that I borrowed from a textbook um, that talks about how to know when, uh, when you have a certain number of solutions. You may want to take a moment and go over that on your own. Now, notice here, the way I've written this, I've used the radical symbol, but I have not put any pluses or minuses here, so we want to be careful about uh, the number of solutions. This just says the cube root of negative 8. What times itself times itself again is negative 8? Well, there's only one possibility, negative 2. The fourth root of 81 is even, so it's going to have two possible solutions, but the way this is written only asks me for the positive one, a 3. C is an interesting problem. What times itself times itself times itself is a 0? Well, that's just a 0. And then D says, what times itself equals negative 8? Well, that's impossible. Anything times itself would always come out as either 0 or a positive number. You have to have a positive times a negative in order to get a negative 8. The last one is the cube root of 729. What times itself times itself again is 729? 9. Notice negative 9 does not work here because 3 negative 9s would give you 3 negative signs, which would be negative 729. Now, I'm going to show you something that I think is really, really cool, but also a little bit weird. You're going to have to watch this carefully. You might also have to um, go back and watch it a second time in order to follow along, because it is, it is a little uh, bizarre, but I, I think it's really interesting. Notice here I've got the square root of 16 squared. Uh, two operations here. The square root of 16, of course, is 4. 4 squared is 16. Notice that when we square root and we square, we end up right back where we started. Same thing happens here with 25. The square root of 25 is 5. Then I square it, I'm back at 25. Squares and square roots undo each other. Cube root of 64 is 4. 4 cubed is 64. Fourth root of 81 is 3. 3 to the 4th is 81. Now, there are some subtle nuances with this rule, um, but, but I'm going to get into those in a different unit. For now, suffice it to say that this 4th root and this 4 are undoing each other. Um, I want to take this a step farther. Notice this and this have the same value. This and this have the same value and these have the same value. This is four different ways to write the exact same value. I'm going to do something really funky here. I'm going to take this one and I'm going to write it differently. I'm going to rewrite it as one half times two. I know I can do that because one half times two does in fact equal one. I wrote it this way on purpose because since it's now multiplication I recognize that this occurs when we're using the power of a power property. Remember we said before, if you have an exponent on the inside of the parentheses raised to another power, then those two things get multiplied. That means these are equal to each other. Well, this is really interesting because if all six of these are the exact same thing or have the exact same value, that means this final value here must be equal to this original value up here. 16 to the 1 half squared is equal to the square root of 16 squared. And since this squared is equal to this squared, 
That means those two items are the same. Weird, right? Let me do it again with a 25. Notice that I've got a square root up here, and I've got a square. I'm going to take this 1, and I'm going to split it into a half times 2. 1 half times 2 does equal 1, so I'm fine there. I do that because now I can rewrite it this way because of the power of a power property that says if you have a power raised to a power, that's where multiplication of exponents comes from. Well, if all six of these are the same, that means that this is equal to this. I got that from up here in the first line. Those are equal to one another. If this squared equals this squared, that means those are the same. Weird, right? Let me do it again. Here I've got third root to the third power. So I'm going to take this 1, I'm going to split it into 1 third times 3. 1 third times 3 does equal 1, so I know I'm fine there. That's the power of a power property. Well, if all six of these are equal, then this is equal to that first row right here. And since they're both raised to the third power and they're equal to each other, that means 64 to the 1 third is equal to the cube root is 64. I can do it over here with 81 as well. Notice it's a fourth root and to the fourth power, so I'm going to make it a one-fourth and a four. Power of a power property. That means these are equal to each other, so 81 to the one-fourth is equal to the fourth root of 81. Essentially, what we've just proven is that a fractional exponent is another way to write a root. comes in really handy um, a little later on when we're dealing with polynomials, but we'll talk about that when the time comes. For now, here's all you need to know. If the problem says to you 9 to the 1 half, you can think of that as the square root of 9, which is 3. If you see 625 to the 1 fourth, that's just asking you what's the fourth root of 625? Well, that's a 5. The fifth root of 32 is a 2. And the cube root of 343 is a 7. Notice here again, I just listed the positive versions. There are um, there, there are sometimes negative versions as well. If I decide to get really fancy on you, do something like 16 to the 3 fourths, don't forget that you can take that 3 fourths and you can split it into 1 fourth and 3 and use your power of a power property. The fourth root of 16 is the same as the fourth root of 16. Well, that's just a 2, and 2 to the third is 8. Same thing over here. Take that four-third and split it into a third and a four. Power of a power property. What times itself? Times itself again is 27. It's a three. 125 to the two-thirds. You split that into a one-third and a two. The cube root of 125 is a five, and five squared is 25. And you can continue that all the way through to the end if you want. Hopefully that's proved interesting for you. We will have some more applications of this a little farther down the road, but for now, the ability just to change the way the, the number appears without changing its value is, is really our goal. Um, thank you so much for taking time to watch. Make sure you leave us a comment in the comment section so we know you're out there. Um, make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on anything we do here at Nunley Math. Best wishes to you guys. Take care.